I'm sorry, I think I have to go over that a bit again. Just to ensure it's important. Okay, so we move on to the equitable beta plane. The LCS equations are um, as we've always had ut minus fp plus px equals tau x by h, and that we set to f. vt plus fu plus py equals tau y by h equals uh, g, and pt by c squared plus ux plus by equals 0. And these equations are for each vertical modem. This, uh, oh. If you say that the is the page of the page of Now, our problem is that in the neighborhood of the equator, f is uh, 2 omega sine theta, and it changes much more rapidly than it does at mid-latitudes. And this is a major change that occurs when we move from the mid-latitudes to the equator. f can no longer be a zone constant. Now, if you recall when we wrote down the in the mid-latitudes, even when we are looking at a beta plane, we got a Rossby wave, we still had an equation with constant coefficients. And uh, this is in spite of having f in um, the cohesion. And uh, the reason is that we assumed f to be a constant except when it was differentiated. That's because f was f0 plus beta y, and in the mid latitudes, f0 dominates. So it's a pretty good approximation to say that f is constant except when you differentiate it, which is when you get the beta effect. But that is no longer possible at the equator because um, <coughs> f goes to zero, and if your domain is uh, centered at the equator, as we often do for the North Indian Ocean, then you have a problem that uh, your central latitude is zero, and therefore if not is zero. So beta y is the dominant term, which means that the variation in f dominates over the mean value. So at the lowest order, you can no longer ignore the, the variation in f. So the equation with constant coefficients is no longer possible. Within about 30 degrees of the equator, however, the sine function describing f can be linearized because sine theta is nearly equal to theta or theta less than 30 degrees, or uh, mod theta less than 30 degrees. This linearization yields what's called a equatorial beta plane, as opposed to the more classical or mid latitude beta plane. In the equatorial beta plane, f is beta y. Uh, this we've looked at in the mid latitude beta plane. We assumed f to be a constant except when it was differentiated. This assumption led to a differential equation with constant coefficients. On the equal beta plane, we get a differential equation, and we'll see that with variable coefficients. And this complicates the problem. Suppose we set dou by dou t plus a by c squared is i omega. We have i omega u minus fp plus px equals f, capital F, i omega b plus fu plus py equals g, and we shall ignore g. We ignore G in the same uh, spirit that we <coughs> looked at longshore winds in the coastal uh, problems. We saw that the uh, cross-shore part is not important. It's the longshore winds that are really important for the physics of the coastal regime. And uh, <coughs> if you look at F going to zero, mathematically it's a singularity. And it turns out that it's not easy to make water cross the equator except near boundaries, either at the surface, where you have uh, the surface boundary layer, or at continental boundaries. At continental boundaries, it's possible, but otherwise, it's not easy in the interior ocean to make the water flow across the equator. So in some sense, mathematically, the equator does act as some kind of a boundary. So you could look at the zonal wind being retained and the meridional wind being dropped as an analogy to the coastal problem. The third equation is i omega p by c squared plus ux plus v y equals 0. <coughs> you can solve for a single equation in v, and that is, in square brackets, we have two terms. Term b is i omega v x x 
plus term A i omega cube by c squared into v. These are identical to what we had earlier in the mid latitude case, except that in term B we also had v y y. Now we don't, because term C is plus i omega into this brace brackets in brace brackets do y y which means the second derivative with respect to y minus f squared by c squared to v. So this operator is operating on v plus beta vx equals i omega f by c squared into capital F minus capital F yx. <coughs> so earlier we had this do y y so that's v y y. We didn't distinguish between v x x and v y y and that's because uh, it didn't matter to us. But now there is a catch. We are at the equator and at the lowest order the variation in f or the variation in y is not something that can be ignored. Which uh, implies that second derivative here with respect to y can no longer be treated in the same way you treat the second derivative with respect to x. So if we ignore beating the meridional momentum equation, we get a much simpler equation as we did earlier. I omega into dou y y minus f squared by c squared into v plus beta v x equals the right hand side. Now terms a and p are not present in the second equation. This simplification will therefore hold only if terms a and p are negligible in comparison to term c. This is exactly what we had done earlier. And we found certain conditions under which this approximation would hold. To make this comparison, we need a measure of term C. Earlier the measure was straightforward, it was just f squared by c squared. So f by c became a measure. We had we set alpha to f by c, and uh, that's all we needed. Now, what is the measure of uh, this term? If you have a measure of this term, then you can compare terms A and B with term C. To make this comparison, we need a measure of uh, term C. Now since f equals beta y, f squared by c squared equals beta squared by c squared into, well, this should be y squared. Now wait a minute. Yeah, beta squared y squared by c squared. So this should be y squared. And uh, it turns out we can show that an appropriate measure of term C is the beta by C. And uh, that leads us to, it turns out as we shall see later, when we look at the dispersion relation, it will come out uh, quite neatly. It turns out as we shall see later that the relevant time scale is omega naught equals square root of beta C. And the relevant length scale is 1 by alpha naught equals square root of C by beta. Earlier we had uh, f uh, c by f as the length scale. Now we have square root of uh, c by beta as the length scale. Earlier our uh, time scale was uh, related just to f. Omega naught was uh, f, and now it is square root of beta c. Omega naught here is the equivalent inertial frequency. At mid latitudes, it is f. And 1 by alpha naught is the equal Rossby radius. C by F instead of square root of C by beta is the Rossby radius in the mid latitudes. Therefore, term A, which is this one. Now, I omega is common to both. So, you have omega squared by C squared here in term A. Term A can be neglected if uh, you can show this 1 by T capital T is much less than omega naught and A by C squared is much less than omega naught. Um, so you have this uh, omega which is a measure of I omega basically which uh, gives you two things. One is a time derivative which means there is a time scale associated with that, that is capital T and the other one is A by C squared, the frictional time scale that comes out of it. So A by C squared is a frequency and that should be much less than omega naught, where omega naught is square root of beta C and 1 by T, the time scale, is also much less than omega naught. 
<coughs> this implies that period. Pardon? That means for a period which is longer than uh, inertial frequency, inertial period. Yeah, so we're coming to that. Okay. That is, tell me, can be neglected. Uh, that is the time scale. Of One thing, uh, there is a meeting. There will be a meeting here, so we have to disconnect. Okay. So you won't be there. No. Okay. YouTube. Mm. Fine. We'll record it anyway mm. for posterity. Uh, that is the time scale of the phenomenon is much greater than the equatorial initial period, and the damping time scale that is c squared by a here is likewise longer. <coughs> so the critical time scale turns out to be initial period. So if the time scale associated with your phenomenon one is this time scale that you get coming from t, and the other one is the frictional one, which we are going to ignore for most uh, cases. So as seen in mid latitudes, here too the damping time scale decreases with increase in mode number. As c squared increases, um, a by c squared will increase, which means the inverse of that will uh, dec uh, decrease. And uh, therefore friction will eventually be important because it will, this term will eventually be greater than the equatorial inertial period for some high order mode. As you keep increasing n, cn decreases, so cn squared decreases, which means this inequality will reverse at some, um, uh, for some n. The term b can be neglected if lx, and uh, that comes from this. That uh, will basically give you k squared, as we shall see sometime later. Term b can be neglected if lx is much greater than 1 by alpha naught. So if your length scale, the zonal length scale is a phenomenon, which means one of two things, either the wavelength or the wave, which uh, from vxx you will get k squared, either that or the zonal extent of the wind patch is much greater than the equatorial gross radius. Now, typical numbers are like this. At the equator, beta is of the order of 2.3 into 10 power minus 13 cent per centimeter per second. So if your C is 230 centimeters per second, we have the initial period square root of beta C is of the order of 10 days. So if the phenomenon we are looking at has a time scale greater than that, and the frictional time scale for low order modes is invariably greater than that, then uh, Vt can be dropped. Likewise, square root of C by beta is of the order of 315 kilometers. This is the equal to the radius for mode 1. For higher order modes, it decreases because C decreases. But note that here it goes as square root in both cases rather than uh, being directly proportional. Now, <coughs> in uh, Most problems that will be of interest, we look at the equatorial Indian Ocean, we go from about uh, 40 degrees east to 100 degrees east, talking of 60 degrees, that's 6,000 kilometers, or 20 times the equatorial gross period is. The Pacific is much uh, longer. And we're generally talking of winds that are on the scale of the basin. We are not talking of small wind patches. So in most cases, that will be of interest to us. As far as the seasonal cycle is concerned, these two conditions will be satisfied. Not two points. First, there is no constraint on the meridional length scale. We had a similar constraint on Ly in the mid-latitude system. Now there is no constraint on Ly. Second, Ut is neg not neglected, Vt is neglected. This retention of UT is a consequence of F vanishing at the equator, which implies that cross equatorial geostrophy is not possible. If you drop UT and you look at a situation where you don't have the wind forcing, you get a case of uh, FP is PX. That's not possible. You can't just cross equatorial geostrophy because F goes to zero at the equator. Geostrophy breaks down. 
only along equatorial geostrophy can hold. So you set Vt to zero. You don't have the meridional wind. You don't have friction. You have Fu balancing Py. That is possible. This term ut is retained to avoid similarities at the equator. If you don't retain ut, you will find that there are uh, uh, cases where you will end up with uh, a division by f leading you to singularities. Retaining ut avoids that. In the mid latitudes, the consequence of ignoring terms a and b is to replace the equivalent balance by the pseudo equivalent balance. We had seen this earlier. At the equator, there's an analogy. The Yoshida balance, we'll see what it means uh, later, is modified to the pseudo Yoshida balance. As before, problems exist near the boundaries. For example, at an eastern boundary, the solutions can develop narrow coastal jets of which LX will be of the order of one mile per month. Then you have, uh, if you go to the coast of Sumatra, for example, you will generate uh, cases where uh, you have coastal jets and you have a problem because the length scale, uh, the x length scale being much larger than the equator Rossby radius will no longer hold if you have medial boundaries and you always have medial boundaries at the equator. Finally, remember that the above equations, uh, repeat this, are written for each meridional mode, but the subscript 10 has been dropped for convenience. That is u of x, y, t is uh, x, y, z, t is sigma over n un of x y t into sin of z and likewise for vn, v and p. This has to be kept in mind and the reason I repeat it is because of uh, what you will uh, see happens when we look at the differential equation of the equator. You will get what are now called meridional mods. So you get one more subset and it is only that subset that we will keep tracking. That is not something we can ignore. But you cannot forget that there is already a subset present here. Each of the equations we are writing down is for a particular uh, vertical mode. Oops, I written for each vertical mode. This is not meridional mode. It should be vertical mode. It's one more correction. It's one more correction. So this meridional should be replaced by vertical. The vertical mode that has subscript in. So two corrections, page two and page four. Okay, so what happens? Let's go back to our equations. For, what, for each vertical mode, we have ut minus ft plus px equals zero. Vt plus Fu plus Py equals 0. Vt by C squared plus Ux plus Vy equals 0. We are reading Vt for now. And we have dropped F because we are now interested in looking at the dispersion relation. So we look for the dispersion relation first and therefore consider only the homogeneous equations. Eliminating U and P yields a single equation in V. We have seen that before, but now we will write it with, uh, <coughs> with the time derivatives intact. Vxxt plus Vyyt minus alpha squared Vt minus v t t t by c squared plus beta v x where alpha is f by c and that's equal to beta y by c. We want to look for solutions proportional to e per i k x minus i sigma t. Unlike at the mid latitudes, we cannot look for solutions proportional to e per i l y. We had e per i l y also earlier because f equals f of pi at the lowest order. So, there is no way you can uh, look for e power i l y. Substitute in uh, this equation, this form e power i k x minus i sigma t, and we get minus k squared v plus v y y minus beta squared y squared by c squared into v plus sigma squared by c squared into v minus k beta by sigma into v equals zero. We have divided throughout the minus i sigma to get this equation because uh, you have time derivatives. Uh, in all of them except beta vx and therefore you have minus i sigma coming out here. Then as usual you will multiply by yeah you get ik and that i will cancel with i of i sigma. 
So you get minus k beta by sigma into v equals zero. Okay. Now this is an equation in y alone. We are going to change variables. We write eta equals square root of beta by c into y or alpha naught into y. So eta is non-dimensional. Because alpha naught has units of one by length and y has unit of length. So we have basically non-dimensionalized y now with respect to the equatorial velocity radius of definition. So eta is alpha naught y implies dou by dou y equals dou by dou eta into dou eta by dou y equals alpha naught dou by dou eta. And likewise dou two by dou two by dou y squared is alpha naught squared into dou two by dou eta squared. And alpha naught squared is beta by c. That has to be kept in mind. So the equation we get is as follows: minus k squared v plus alpha naught squared into open bracket dou two by dou eta squared minus eta squared close bracket v plus sigma squared by c squared v minus beta k by sigma v equals zero. The term in brackets, that is dou two by dou eta squared minus eta squared, suggests that we expand into eigenfunctions of dou eta eta minus eta squared into v. This is exactly what we did when formulating the LCS model. We looked at the form of uh, the z derivatives. In fact, if you remember, we had made some very clever manipulations. In the form of friction, and that is what allowed us to get the same form for the y der z derivative. And once we had the same form, we could expand the eigenfunctions in the vertical. Right? We basically got a Stone-Liouville problem. We got uh, an equation for psi n, and uh, c n squared turned out to be the eigenvalues. We get something similar here. We use the fact that the special choices made for the vertical mixing terms. Led to the same form of the z derivatives to expand into vertical normal modes. Now we expand for each vertical mode into meridional normal modes because this derivative occurs only here. So we are going to basically replace dou two by dou eta squared minus eta squared this operator operating on v by minus gamma l squared into v. So all these v's will have subset n. So basically, we're going to get one more Stone-Liouville problem, one more set of eigenfunctions. The resulting eigenfunctions are called Hermit functions, which are related to in many books you will find this, especially in math books, parabolic cylindrical functions. And the eigenvalues are gamma squared, gamma l squared. Gamma L squared equals two L plus one. So page six also has one. Other. All even pages. Gamma L squared equals two L plus one. So now consider this equation here. We have phi L as the function, the eigen function. So phi L eta eta. Minus eta squared phi l equals minus gamma l squared phi l. Okay, this is exactly what we had in the earlier case when we were looking at the vertical modes. So we have one more stone level problem here. Phi l eta eta minus eta squared phi l equals minus gamma l squared phi l. That's it. Subject to the boundary condition, phi l goes to zero as eta goes to infinity. Now, as eta goes to infinity, y goes to infinity. As eta goes to minus infinity. Y goes to minus infinity. Okay, this should be eta goes to plus minus infinity. File has to go to zero at both extremes. So um, this would be a boundary condition. So let's consider now. Now we are going to do certain things. We have that uh, problem. We have a differential equation. Before we get down to writing down the solution, uh, we play a few tricks to see. Uh, let it unfold gradually. Let's look at the operator. 
do eta minus eta operating on phi okay so it's uh, d by d eta minus eta it's operating on phi let capital phi equals this uh, do eta minus eta into phi so when you operate with this operator on phi the result is capital phi what does that mean do eta eta minus eta squared into capital phi in this operating on capital phi this is a basic differential equation this is do eta eta minus eta squared into do eta minus eta phi now expand the first two terms will give you do eta 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 then you get do eta eta into eta with a minus sign we are keeping it as it is for reasons as uh, will be clear in a few minutes minus eta squared do eta plus eta q so this is the operator and it operates on phi now do eta eta of eta into a variable q is do eta into eta q eta okay where substrate eta basically tells you it's a derivative so this is do eta into if you differentiate eta q with respect to eta you get q plus eta q eta you differentiate eta first so you get q you differentiate q next so you get eta into q eta and you have to differentiate that again with respect to eta this will give you q eta then you differentiate eta you get q eta so it's q eta plus q eta plus eta into q eta eta fine equals 2q eta plus eta into q eta eta which means do eta 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 q minus eta do eta eta operating on q is equal to 2q eta okay so if we write this in operator form alone if we take the q out it means do eta eta to eta minus eta into do eta eta equals 2 do eta but this essentially means that you cannot swap eta and do eta eta okay uh, we'll close it here we'll break for tea and uh, come back and continue this